Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel Read With Me once again and today I am here with a beautiful book called The Mastery of Destiny which is written by James Ellen. So without wasting a single second, let's dive into it or delve into it and start it. It starts with a preface. So let's read it out. The discovery of the law of evolution in the material world has prepared men for a knowledge of the law of cause and effect in the mental world. Thought is not less orderly and progressive than the material forms which embody thought, and not alone cells and atoms but thoughts and deeds are charged with a cumulative and selective energy. In the realm of thought and deed, the good survives, for it is fittest, the evil ultimately perishes. To know that the perfect law of causation is as alembracing in mind as in matter is to be relieved from all anxiety concerning the ultimate destiny of individuals and of humanity. For man is a man and master of his fate. And the will in man which is conquering the knowledge of natural law will conquer the knowledge of spiritual law. The will which in ignorance chooses evil will as wisdom evolves and emerges choose good. In a universe of law, the final mastery of evil by man is assured. His lesser destinies of separation and sorrow, defeat and death, are but disciplinary steps leading to the great destiny of trample mastery. He himself is unconsciously building, albeit with lacrated hands and labor bowed form, the temple of glory which is to afford him an eternal habitation of peace. In this volume one, sorry, in this volume, I have tried to set down some words indicative of this law and this destiny and the manner of its working and its building and have so arranged the subject matter as to make the book a companion volume to the life trumpet. The first six and the last chapters first appeared in Bibi's Quarterly and Bibi's Annual. And it is by kind permission of the editor, Mr. Joseph Bibby, that they are now brought together and published in volume form. The other three chapters having been added to make the book consecutive and complete. James Allen, Brino Glew, Ifrecomb, England, April 1909. Let's start. Number one, deeds, character, and destiny. There is and always has been a widespread belief in fate or destiny that is in an eternal and instructable power which apportions, you know, like which apportions definite ends to both individuals and nations. This belief has arisen from long observation of the facts of life. Men are conscious that there are certain occurrences which they cannot control and are powerless to avert. Birth and death, for instance, are inevitable and many of the incidents of life appear equally inevitable. Men strain every nerve for the attainment of certain aims and gradually they become conscious of a power which seems to be not of themselves, which frustrates the, their punny efforts and laughs, as it were, at their fruitless striving and struggle. As men advance in life, they learn to submit more or less to this overruling power which they do not understand perceiving only its effects in themselves and the world around them. And they call it by various names such as God, Providence, Fate, Destiny, etc. 
men of contemplation such as poets and philosophers step aside as it were to watch the movements of his of this mysterious power as it seems to elevate its favorites on the one hand and strike down its victims on the other without reference to merit or demerit the greatest poets especially the dramatic poets represent this power in their works as they have observed it in nature the greek and roman dramatists usually depict their heroes as having for knowledge of their fate and taking means to escape it but by so doing they blindly or they blindly involve themselves in a series of consequences which bring about the doom which they are trying to avert Shakespeare's characters on the other hand are represented as in nature with no foreknowledge except in the form of you know like presentment of their particular destiny thus according to the poets whether the man knows his fate or not he cannot avert it and every conscious or unconscious act of his is a step towards it Omar Khayyam's moving finger is a vivid expression of this idea of fate the moving finger writes and having right moves on nor all thy pity nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line nor all thy tears wash out a word of it thus men in all nations and times have experienced in their lives the action of this invincible power of law and in our nation today this experience has been crystallized in the tears proverb man proposes god disposes but contradictory as it may appear there is an equally widespread belief in man's responsibility as a free agent all moral teaching is an affirmation of man's freedom to choose his course and mold his destiny and man's patient and untiring efforts in achieving his ends are declarations of consciousness of freedom and power this dual experience of fate on the one hand and freedom on the other has given rise to the interminable controversy between the believers in fatalism and the upholders of free will a controversy which was recently revived under the term determinism versus free will between apparently conflicting extremes there is always a middle way of balance justice or compensation which while it includes both extremes cannot be said to be either one or the other and which brings both into harmony and this middle way is the point of contact between two extremes truth cannot be a partition but by its nature is a reconciler of extremes and so in the matter which we are considering there is a golden mean which brings fate and free will into close relationship wherein indeed it is seen that these two indisputable facts in human life for such they are are but two aspects of one central law one unifying and all embracing principle namely the law of causation in its moral aspect moral causation necessitates both fate and free will both individual responsibility and individual predestination for the law of causes must also be the law of effects and cause and effect must always be equal the train of causation both in matter and mind must be eternally balanced therefore eternally just eternally perfect thus every effect may be said to be a thing preordained but the predetermining power is a cause and not the fiat of an you know like arbitrary will man finds himself involved in the train of causation his life is made up of causes and effects if or it is both a uh, showing and reaping each act of his is a cause which must be balanced by its effects he chooses the cause this is free will he cannot choose alter or avert the effect this is fate thus free will stands for the power to in- initiate causes and destiny is involvement in effects 
it is therefore true that man is predestined to certain ends but he himself has or thought he knows is not you should the man debt that good or evil thing from which there is no escape he has by his own deeds brought about it may here be urged that man is not responsible for his deeds that these are the effects of his character and that he is not responsible for the character good or bad which was given him at his birth if character was given him at birth this would be true and there would then be no moral law and no need for moral teaching but characters are not given ready made they are evolved they are indeed effects the products of the moral law itself that is the products of deeds character result of an accumulation of deeds which have been piled up so to speak by the individual during his life man is the doer of his own deeds as such he is the maker of his own character and as the doer of his deeds and the maker of his character he is the molder and shaper of his destiny he has the power to modify and after his deeds and every time he acts he modifies his character and with the modification of his character for good or evil he is predetermining for himself new destinies destinies this you know like this astros or beneficent in accordance with the nature of his deeds character is destiny itself as a fixed combination of deeds it bears within itself the results of those deeds these results lie hidden as moral seeds in the dark recesses of the character awaiting their season of germination growth and fruitage or yeah fruitage now those things which befall a man are the reflections of himself that destiny which pursued him which he was powerless to escape by effort or avert by prayer was the relentless goal of his own wrong deeds demanding and enforcing restitutions those blessings and curses which come to him unbidden are the reverberating echoes of the sounds which he himself sent forth it is this knowledge of the perfect law working through and above all things of the perfect justice operating in and adjusting all human affairs that enables the good man to love his enemies and to rise above all hatred resentment and complaining for he knows that only his own can come to him and that though he be surrounded by you know like the persecutors his enemies are but the blind uh, instruments of a sorry blind instruments of a faultless retribution and so he blames them not but calmly receives his accounts and patiently pays his moral debts but this is not all he does not merely pay his debts he takes care not to contract any further debts he watches himself and makes his deeds faultless while paying off evil accounts he is laying up good accounts by putting an end to his own sin he is bringing evil and suffering to an end and now let us consider how the law operates in particular instances in the outworking of destiny through deeds and character first we will look at this present life for the present is the synthesis of the entire past the net result of all that a man has ever thought and done is contained within him it is noticeable that sometimes the good man fails and the unscrupulous man prospers a fact which seems to put all moral maxims as to the good results of righteousness out of account and because of this many people deny the operation of any just law in human life and even declare that it is chiefly the unjust that prosper nevertheless the moral law exists and is not altered or subverted by shallow conclusions it should be remembered that a man is a changing evolving being the good man was not always good the bad man was not always bad even in this life there was a time in a large number of instances when the man who is now just was unjust when he who is now kind was cruel when he who is you know like when he who is now pure was impure 
conversely there was a time in his life there was a time in this life in a number of instances when he who is now unjust was just when he who is now cruel was kind when who he is you know like when he who is now impure was pure thus the good man who is overtaken with calamity today is reaping the result of his former evil showing later he will reap the happy results of his present good showing while the bad man is now reaping the result of his former good showing later he will reap the result of his present showing of bad characteristics are fixed habits of mind the results of deeds an act repeated a large number of times becomes unconscious or automatic that is it then seems to repeat itself without any effort on the part of the doer so that it seems to him almost impossible not to do it and then it has become a mental characteristic here is a poor man out of work he is honest and is not a shrieker he wants work and cannot get it <clears throat> he tries hard and continues to fail where is the justice is he not there was a time in this man's condition when he had plenty of work he felt burdened with it he shrieked it and longed for ease he thought how delightful it would be to have nothing to do he did not appreciate the you know like the blessedness of his lot his desire for ease is now gratified but the fruit for which he longed and which he thought would taste so sweet has turned to ashes in his mouth the condition which he admired for namely to have nothing to do he has reached and there he is compelled to remain till his lesson is thoroughly learned and he is surely learning that habitual ease is degrading that to have nothing to do is a condition of wretchedness and that work is a noble and blessed thing his former desires and deeds have brought him where he is and now his present desire for work is ceaseless searching and asking for it will just as surely bring about its own benefit or beneficent result no longer desiring idleness his present condition will as an effect the cause of which is no longer propagated soon pass away and he will obtain employment and if his whole mind is now set on work and he desires it above all else then when it comes he will be overwhelmed with it it will flow into him from all sides and he will prosper in his industry then if he does not understand the law of cause and effect in human life he will wonder why work comes to him apparently uh, you know like unshot while others who shake it strenuously fail to obtain it nothing comes unbidden where the shadow is there also is the substance that which comes to the individual is the product of his own deeds as cheerful industry leads to greater industry and increasing prosperity and labor shirked on under taken discontently leads to a lesser degree of labor and deceasing prosperity so with all the varied conditions of life as we see them they are the destinies wrought by the thoughts and deeds of each particular individual so also with the past variety of characters they are the ripening and ripened growth of the showing of deeds as the individual reaps what he shows show the nation being a community of individuals reaps also what it shows nations become great when their leaders are just men they fall and fade when their just men pass away those who are in power set an example good or bad for the entire nation great will be the peace and prosperity of a nation when there shall arise within it a line of statesmen who having first established themselves in a lofty integrity of character shall direct the energies of the nation toward the culture of virtue and development of character knowing that only through personal industry integrity and nobility can national prosperity proceed still above all is the great law calmly and with infallible justice meeting or sorry justice meeting out to morals their fleeting destinies tear stained or smiling the fabric of their hands life is a great school for the development of character and all 
through strife and struggle, vice and virtue, success and failure are slowly but surely learning the lessons of wisdom. Number two, the science of self-control. We live in a scientific age. Men of science are numbered by thousands and they are ceaselessly searching, analyzing and experimenting with a view to discovery and the increase of knowledge. The selves of our libraries, both public and private, are heavy with their load of imposing volumes on scientific subjects and the wonderful achievements of modern science are always before us, whether in our homes or in our streets, in country or town or land or sea. There shall we have before us some marvelous device, some recent accomplishment of science for adding to our comfort, increasing our speed or saving the labor of our hands. Yet with all our vast store of scientific knowledge and its startling and rapidly increasing results in the world of discovery and invention, there is in this age one branch of science which has, fo which has so far fallen into decay as to have become almost forgotten, a science nevertheless which is of greater importance than all the other sciences combined and without which all science would but subverse or you know like that subserve the ends of selfishness and aid in man's destruction i refer to the science to or i refer to the science of self control our modern scientists study the elements and forces which are outside themselves which the object of controlling and utilizing them. The ancients studied the elements and forces which were within themselves with a view to controlling and utilizing them. And the ancients produced such mighty masters of knowledge in the direction that to this day they are held in reverence as gods and the vast religious organizations of the world are based upon their achievements. Wonderful as are the forces in nature, they are vastly inferior to, the, to that combination of intelligent forces which comprise the mind of man and which dominate and direct the blind mechanical force of nature. Therefore, it follows that to understand, control and direct the inner forces of passion, desire, will and intellect is to be in possession of the destinies of men and nations. As in ordinary science, there are in this divine science degrees of attainment and a man is great in knowledge, great in himself and great in his influence on the world in the measure that he is great in self-control. He who understands and dominates the forces of eternal or external nature is the natural scientist. But he who understands and you know, like dominates the internal forces of the mind is the divine scientist and the laws which operate in gaining a knowledge external appearances operate also in gaining a knowledge of internal varieties a man cannot become an accomplished scientist in a few weeks or months nay not even in a few years but only after many years of painstaking investigation can he speak with authority and be ranked among the masters of science likewise a man cannot acquire self-control and become possessed of the wisdom and peace-giving knowledge which you know like that self-control confers but by many years of patient labor a labor which is all the more arduous because it is silent and both unrecognized and unappreciated by others and he who would pursue this science successfully must learn to stand alone and to toil unrewarded as far as any outward emolu you know like emolu sorry emolument is concerned. The natural scientist pursues in acquiring his particular kind of knowledge, the knowledge or the following five orderly and sequential or sequential steps. Number one, observation. That is, he closely and persistently observes the facts of nature. Number two, experiment. Having become acquainted by repeated observations with certain facts, he experiments with those facts with a view to the discovery of natural laws. He puts his facts through rigid process of analysis and so finds out what is useless and what of value. And he rejects the former and retains the latter. Number three, classification. Having accumulated and verified 
verified a mass of facts by numberless observations and experiments, he commences to classify those facts to arrange them in orderly groups with the object of discovering some underlying law, some hidden and un, you know like uninfying principle which governs, regulates and binds together these facts. Number four, deduction. Thus he passes on to the fourth step of deduction from the from the facts and results which are before him, he discovers certain inevitable or invariable modes of action and thus reveals the hidden laws of things. Number five, knowledge. Having proven and established certain laws, it may be said of such a man that he knows he is a scientist, a man of knowledge. But the attainment of scientific knowledge is not the end. Great as it is, men do not attain knowledge for themselves alone, nor to keep it locked secretly in their hearts like a beautiful jewel in the dark chest. The end of such knowledge is use, service, the increase of the comfort and happiness of the world. Thus, when a man has become a scientist, he gives the world the benefit of his knowledge and unselfishly bestows upon mankind the results of all his labors. Thus, beyond knowledge, there is a farther step of use that is the right and unselfish selfish use of the knowledge acquired, the application of knowledge to invention for the common will. It will be noted that the five steps or processes immunated or you know like enumerated follow in orderly succession and that no man can become a scientist who omits any one of them. Without the first step of systematic observation, for instance, he could not even enter the realm of knowledge of nature's secrets. At first, the searcher for such knowledge has before him a universe of things, these things he does not understand. Many of them indeed seem to be irreconcilably opposed one to the other and there is apparent confusion but by patiently and laboriously pursuing these five processes he discovers the order nature and essence of things perceives the central law of laws which bind them together in harmonious relationship and so puts an end to confusion and ignorance as with the natural scientist so with the divine scientist he must pursue with the same self-sacrificing diligence five progressive steps in the attainment of self-knowledge, self-control. These five steps are the same as with the natural scientist, but the process is reversed. The mind, instead of being centered upon external things, is turned back upon itself and the investigations are pursued in the realm of mind, of one's own mind, instead of in that of matter. At first, the searcher for divine knowledge is confronted with that mass of desires, passions, emotions, ideas, and intellectuals which he calls himself, which is the basic of all his actions and from which his life proceeds. This combination of invisible or invisible yet powerful forces appears confusedly. Uh, some of them stand apparently in direct conflict with each other without any appearance or hope of reconciliation. His mind in its entirely too with his life which proceeds from that mind does not seem to have any equitable relation to many other their minds and leaves about them and you know like and leaves about them and altogether there is a condition of pain and confusion from which he would fain uh, escape Thus he begins by keenly realizing his state of ignorance for no one could acquire either natural or divine knowledge if he were convinced that without study or labor he already possessed it with such perception of one's ignorance, there comes the desire for knowledge and the novice in self-control enters upon the ascending pathway in which are the following five steps. The first one is introspection. This coincides with the observation of the natural scientist. The mental eye is turned like a search light upon the inner things of the mind and its subtle and ever varying processes are observed and carefully noted. The stepping aside from selfish gratifications from the excitements of worldly pleasure and ambitions in order to observe. With the object of understanding one's nature is the beginning of self-control. Hitherto, the man has been uh, blindly and importantly borne along by the impulses of his nature, the mere creature of things and circumstances, but now he puts a check upon his impulses and instead of being controlled, begins to control. Now, second step is self-analysis. Having observed the tenderness or tendencies, sorry, tendencies of the mind they are then closely examined and put and are put together 
and are put through a rigid process of analysis. The evil tendencies uh, which is you know like that produce painful effects are separated from the good tendencies and the various tendencies which with the particular actions they produced and the uh, definite results which inevitably spring from these actions are gradually grasped by the understanding which is at last actually enabled to follow them in their swift and subtle interplay and profound uh, ramification. It is a process of testing and providing or proving and for the searcher a period of being tested and uh, proved. Now number three is adjustment. By this time the particular student of things divine has clearly before him every tendency and aspect of his nature down to the profoundest promptings of his mind and the most subtle motives of his heart. There is not a spot of corner left which he has not explored and illuminated with the light of self-examination. He is familiar with every weak and self you know like selfish point every strong and virtuous quality it is considered the height of wisdom to be able to see ourselves as others see us but the practitioner or the by the practitioners of self-control goes far beyond this he not only sees himself as others see him he sees himself as he is does a standing face to face with himself not striving to hide away from any secret fault no longer defending himself with pleasant fatteries neither underrating nor overrating himself or his powers and no more cursed with self-praise or self-pity. He sees the full magnitude of the task which lies before him. She is dearly ahead the heights of self-control and knows what work he has to do to reach them. He is no longer in a state of confusion but has gained a glimpse of the laws which operate in the world of thought and he now begins to adjust his mind in accordance with those laws. This is a process of waiting. This is a process of weeding, shifting, cleansing. And as the farmer weeds, cleans and prepares the ground for his crops, so the student removes the weeds of evil from his mind, cleanses and purifies its actually preparatory to showing the seeds of righteous actions which shall produce the harvest of a well-ordered life. Number four, righteousness. Having adjusted these thoughts and deeds to those minor laws which operate in mental activity it is in the production of pain and pleasure, unrest and peace, sorrow and bliss. He now perceives that there is involved in those laws one great central law which like the law of gravitation in the natural world is supreme in the world of mind. A law to which all thoughts and deeds are you know like subservient and by which they are regulated and kept in their proper sphere. This is the law of justice or righteousness, which is universal and supreme. To this law he now conforms, instead of thinking and acting blindly as the nature is stimulated and appealed to by outward things, he subordinates his thoughts and deeds to this central principle. He no longer acts from himself, but does what is right what is universally and eternally right. He is no longer the subject slave of his nature and circumstances. He is the master of his nature and circumstances. He is no longer carried hither and thither on the forces of his mind. He controls and guides those forces to the accomplishment of his purposes. Thus having his nature in control and subjection, not thinking thoughts nor doing deeds which oppose the right to his law and which therefore that law amules or annuls actually with suffering and defeat, he rises above the domination of sin and sorrow, ignorance and doubt, and strong, calm and peaceful. Number five is pure knowledge. By thinking right and acting right, he proves by experience the existence of the divine law on which the mind is framed and which is the guiding and unifying principle in all human affairs and events, whether individual or national. Thus, by perfecting himself in self-control, he acquires divine knowledge. He reaches the point where it may be said of him him as of the natural scientist that he knows. He has mastered the science of self-control and has brought knowledge out of ignorance, order out of confusion. He has acquired that knowledge of self which includes knowledge of all men, that knowledge of one's own life which embraces knowledge of all life as for all minds are the same in essence are framed upon the same law and the same thoughts and acts by whatsoever individual they are wrought 
will always produce the same results. But this divine and peace bestowing knowledge as in the case of the natural scientist is not gained for oneself alone. For if this were so, the aim of evolution would be frustrated and it is not in the nature of things to fall short of ripening and accomplishment. And indeed he who thought to gain this knowledge solely for his own happiness would most surely fail. So beyond the fifth step of pure knowledge, there is a still further one of wisdom, which is the right application of the knowledge acquired, the pouring out upon the world unselfishly and without sin, the result of one's labors, thus accelerating progress and uplifting humanity. It may be said of men who have not gone back into their own nature to control and purify it, that they cannot clearly distinguish between good and evil, right or wrong. They really reach after those things which they think will give them pleasure and try to avoid those things which they believe will cause them pain. The source of their actions is self and they only discover right painfully and in a fragmentary way by periodically passing through severe sufferings and lashings of conscience. But he who practices self-control passing through the five processes, uh, which are five stages of growth, gains that knowledge which enables him to act from the moral law which actually sustains the universe. He knows good and evil, right and wrong, and thus knowing them lives in accordance with good and right. He no longer needs to consider what is pleasant or what is unpleasant, but does what is right. His nature is in harmony with his conscience, and there is no remorse. His mind is in unison with the great law. And there is no more suffering and sin. For him evil is ended and good is all in all. Number three. Cause and effect in human conduct. It is an axiom with the scientists that every effect is related to a cause. Apply this to the realm of human conduct and there is revealed the principle of justice. Every scientist knows and now all men believe that perfect harmony prevails throughout every portion of the physical universe. From the speak of dust to the greatest sun, everywhere there is exquisite adjustment. In the sidereal universe, with its millions of suns rolling majestically through space and carrying with them their respective systems of revolving planets, its vast nebula, its seas of meteors, and its vast army of comets traveling through illimitable space with inconceivable velocity. Perfect order prevails. And again in the natural world with its multitudinous aspects of life and its infinite variety of forms, there are the clearly defined limits of specific laws through the operation of which all confusion is avoided and unity and harmony eternally obtained. If this universal harmony could be arbitrarily broken even in one small particular, the universe would cease to be. There could be no cosmos but only universal chaos. Nor can it be possible in such a universe of law that there should exist any personal power which is above, outside and superior to such law in the sense that it can defy it or set it aside. For whatsoever beings exist, whether they be men or gods, they exist by virtue of such law. And the highest, best and wisest among all beings would manifest his greater wisdom by his more complete obedience to that law which is wiser than wisdom and then which nothing more perfect could be devised. All things, whether visible or invisible, are 
subservient to and fall within the scope of this infinite and eternal law of causation. As all things seen obey it, so all things unseen, the thoughts and deeds of men, whether secret or open, cannot escape it. Do right, it recompenseth. Do one wrong, the equal retribution must be made. Perfect justice upholds the universe. Perfect justice regulates human life and conduct. All the varying conditions of life as they obtain in the world today are the result of this law reacting on human conduct. Man can and does choose what causes he shall set in operation, but he cannot change the nature of effects. He can decide what thoughts he shall think and what deeds he shall do, but he has no power over the results of those thoughts and deeds. These are regulated by the overruling law. Man has all power to act, but his power ends with the act committed. The result of the act cannot be altered, annulled, or escaped. It is irrevocable. Evil thoughts and deeds produce conditions of suffering. Good thoughts and deeds determine conditions of blessedness. Thus man's power is limited to and his blessedness or misery is determined by his own conduct. To know this truth renders life simple, plain and unmistakable. All the crooked paths are strengthened out the highest of wisdom are revealed and the open door to salvation from evil and suffering is perceived and entered. Life may be likened to a sum in arithmetic. It is bewilderingly difficult and complex to the people who has not yet grasped the key to its correct solution. But once this is perceived and laid hold of, it becomes as astonishingly simple as it was formerly profoundly perplexing. Some idea of this relative simplicity and complexity of life may be grasped by fully recognizing and realizing the fact that while there are scores and perhaps hundreds of ways in which of some may be done wrong, there is only one way by which it can be done right. And that when the right way is found, the people knows it to be the right. His perplexity vanishes and he knows that he has mastered the problem. It is true that that the people that the people who you know like while doing his sum incorrectly may and frequently does think he has done it correctly but she is not sure his perplexity is still there and if he is an earnest and apt pupil he will recognize his own error when it is pointed out by the teacher so in life, men may think they are living rightly while they are continuing through ignorance to live wrongly. But the presence of doubt, perplexity and unhappiness are sure indications that the right way has not yet been found. There are foolish and careless pupils who would like to pass a sum as correct before they have acquired a true knowledge of figures, but the eye and skill of the teacher quickly detect and expose the fallacy. So in life there can be no fallacy, you know, like falsifying of results. The eye of the great law reveals and exposes. Twice five will make ten to all eternity, and no amount of ignorance, stupidity, or delusion can bring the result up to eleven. If one looks superficially at a piece of cloth, he sees it as a piece of cloth, but if he goes farther and inquires into its manufacture and examines it closely and attentively, he sees that it is composed of a combination of individual threads and, what, and, and that while all the threads are interdependent, each thread pursues its own way throughout, never becoming confused with its sister thread. It is this entire absence of confusion between the particular threads which constitutes the finished work, a piece of cloth. Any inharmonious coming, you know, like uh, commingling of the thread would result in a bundle of waste or a useless rag. Life is like a piece of cloth, and, and the threads of which it is composed are individual lives. 
the threads while being interdependent are not confounded one with the other each follows its own course each individual suffers and enjoys the consequences of his own deeds and not of the deeds of another the course of which is simple and definite the whole forming as you know like complicated yet harmonious combination of sequences there are action and reaction deed and consequence cause and effect and the counterbalancing reaction consequence and effect is always in exact ratio with the initiatory impulse a durable and satisfactory piece of cloth cannot be made from shoddy material and the threads of selfish thoughts and bad deeds will not produce a useful and beautiful life a life that will wear well and bear close inspection each man makes or mars his own life it is not made or marred by his neighbor or by anything external to himself each thought he thinks each deed he does is another thread shoddy or genuine woven into the garment of his life and as he makes the garment so must he wear it he is not responsible for his neighbor's deeds he is not the custodian of his neighbor's action he is responsible only and only for his own deeds he is a custodian of his own actions the problem of evil subsists in a man's own evil deeds and it is solved when does you know like when those deeds are purified says rousseau man seek no longer the origin of evil thou thyself art is origin effect can never be divorced from cause it can never be of a different nature from cause emarchion says justice is not postponed a perfect equity adjusts the balance in all parts of life and there is a profound sense in which cause and effect are simultaneous and form one perfect whole thus upon the instant that a man thinks say a cruel thought or does a cruel deed that same instant he has injured his own mind he is not the same man he was the previous instant he is a little viler and a little more unhappy and a number of such successive thoughts and deeds would produce a cruel and wretched man the same thing applies to the contrary the thinking of a kind thought or doing a kind deed and immediately an immediate nobility and happiness attained it the man is better than he was before and a number of such deeds would produce a great and peaceful soul so thus individual human conduct determines by the faultless law of cause and effect individual merit or demerit individual greatness or meanness individual happiness or wretchedness what a man thinks that he does what he does that he is if he is perplexed unhappy restless or wretched let him look to himself for there and nowhere else is the source of all his trouble number 4 training of the will without strength of mind nothing worthy of accomplishment can be done and the cultivation of that steadfastness and stability of character which is commonly called will power is one of the foremost duties of man for its possession is essentially necessary both to his temporal and eternal well-being fixedness of purpose is at the root of all successful efforts whether in things worldly or spiritual and without it man cannot be otherwise than wretched and dependent upon others for the support which should be found within himself the mystery which has been thrown around the subject of cultivation of the will by those who advertise to sell occult advice on the matter for so many dollars should be avoided and dispelled for nothing could be farther removed from secrecy and mystery than the particular than the practical methods by which alone strength of will can be developed the true path of will cultivation is only to be found in the common everyday life of the individual and so obvious and simple is it that the majority looking for something complicated and mysterious pass it by unnoticed 
A little logical thought will soon convince a man that he cannot be both weak and strong at the same time, that he cannot develop a stronger will while remaining a slave to weak indulgences, and that therefore the direct and only way to that greater strength is to assail and conquer his weakness. All the means for the cultivation of the will are already at hand in the mind and life of the individual. They reside in the weak side of his character by attracting and vanquishing which the necessary strength of will be developed. He who has succeeded in grasping this simple preliminary truth will perceive that the whole science of will cultivation is embodied in the following seven rules. Number one break off bad habits number two form good habits number three give scrupulous attention to the duty of the present moment number four do vigorously and at once whatever has to be done number five leave by rule number six control the tongue number seven control the mind Anyone who earnestly meditates upon and diligently practices the above rules will not fail to develop that purity of purpose and power of will which will enable him to successfully cope with every difficulty and pass triumphantly through every emergency. It will be seen that the first step is the breaking away from bad habits. This is no easy task. It demands the putting forth of great efforts or a succession of efforts and it is by such efforts that the will can alone be in you know like invigorated and fortified if one refuses to take the first step he cannot increase in willpower for by submitting to a bad habit because of the immediate pleasure which it affords one forfeits the right to rule over himself and is so far a weak slave he who does avoid self-discipline and looks about for some occult secrets for gaining willpower at the expenditure of little or no effort on his part is deluding himself and is weakening the willpower which he already possesses. The increased strength of will which is gained by success in overcoming bad habits enables one to initiate good habits. For while the conquering of a bad habit requires merely strength of purpose, the forming of a new one necessitates the intelligent direction of purpose. To do this, a man must be mentally active and energetic and must keep a constant watch upon himself. As a man succeeds in perf perfecting himself in the second rule, it will Will not be very difficult for him to observe the third, that of giving scrupulous attention to the duty of the present moment. Thoroughness is a step in the development of the will which cannot be passed over. Slipshod work is an indication of weakness. Perfection should be aimed at, even in the smallest task. By not dividing the mind but giving the whole attention to each separate task as it presents itself, singleness of purpose and intense concentration of mind are gradually gained. Two mental powers which give weight and worth of character and bring repose and joy to their possessor. The fourth rule, that of doing vigorously and at once whatever has to be done, is equally important. Idleness and a strong, you know, like idleness and a strong will cannot go together. And procrastination is a total barrier to the acquisition of purposeful action. Nothing should be put off until another time, not even for a few minutes. That which ought to be done now should be done now. This seems a little thing, but it is of far-reaching importance. It leads to strength, success and peace. The man who is to manifest a cultivated will must also lead by certain fixed rules. He must not blindly, you know, like gratify his passions and impulses, but must school them to obedience. He should live accordingly to principle and not accordingly to passion. He should decide what he will eat and drink and wear and what he will not eat and drink and wear, how many meals per day he will have and at what times he will have them, at what time he will go to bed and what at what time will he will get up. He should make rules 
for the right government of his conduct in every department of his life and should religiously adhere to them. To live loosely and indiscriminately, eating and drinking and sensuously indulging at the beck and call of appetite and inclination is to be a mere animal and not a man with will and reason. The best in man must be, you know, like scar scourged and disciplined and brought into subjection. And this can only be done by training the mind and life on certain fixed rules of right conduct. The saint attains to holiness by not violating his vows, uh, you know, like his vows. Or, and the man who lives accordingly to good and fixed rules is strong to accomplish his purpose. The sixth rule, that of controlling the tongue, must be practiced until one has perfect command of his speech, so that he utters nothing in you know, like peevishness, anger, irritability, or with evil intent. The man of strong will does not allow his tongue to run th thoughtlessly and without check. All these six rules, if faithfully practiced, will lead up to the seventh, which is the most important of them all, namely, rightly controlling the mind. Self-control is the most essential thing in life, yet least understood. But he who patiently practices the rules herein laid down, bringing them into requisition in all his ways and undertakings, will learn by his own experience and efforts how to control and train his mind and to earn thereby the supreme crown of manhood, the crown of a perfectly poised will. Number five, thoroughness. Thoroughness consists in doing little things as though they were the greatest things in the world. That the little things of life are of primary importance is a truth not generally understood and the thought that little things can be neglected, thrown aside or slurred over is at the root of that lack of thoughtness which is so common and which results in imperfect work and unhappy lives. When one understands that the great things of the world and of life consists of a combination of small things and that without this aggregation of small things the great things would be non-existent then he begins to pay careful attention to those things which he formerly regarded as insignificant he thus acquires the quality of thoroughness and becomes a man of usefulness and influence for the possession or non-possession of this one quality may mean all the difference between a life of peace and power and one of misery and weakness Every employer of labor knows how comparatively rare this quality is, how difficult it is to find men and women who will put thought and energy into their work and do it completely and satisfactorily. Bad workmanship abounds. Skill and excellence are acquired by few. Thoughtful, thoughtlessness, carelessness and laziness are such common vices that it should be ceased to appear strange that in spite of social reform, the ranks of the unemployed should continue to swell for those who scamp their work today will another day in the, to in the hour of deep necessity look and ask for work in pain. The law of the survival of the fittest is not based on cure, you know, like cruelty. It is based on justice. It is one aspect of that divine equity which everywhere prevails. Vice is beaten with many stripes. If it were not so, how could virtue be developed? The thoughtless and you know, like the, the thoughtless and lazy cannot take cannot take precedence of or stand equally with the thoughtful and industrious. A friend of mine tells me that his father gave all his children the following piece of advice. Whatever your future work may be, put your whole mind upon it and do it thoroughly. You need then have no fear as to your welfare. For there are so many who are careless and negligent that the services of the thorough man are always in demand. I know those who have for years tried almost in vain to secure competent workmanship in spares which do not require exceptional skill but which call chiefly for 
forethought, energy, and consent, you know, like conscientious care. They have discharged one after another for negligence, laziness, incompetence, and persistent breaches of duty, not to mention other vices which have no bearing on this subject. Yet the vast army of the unemployed continues to cry out against the laws, against society, and against heaven. The cause of this common lack of thoroughness is not far to seek. It lies in that thirst for pleasure which not only creates a distaste for steady labor but renders one incapable of doing the best work and of properly fulfilling one's duty. A short time ago, a case came under my observation, one of many such, of a poor woman who was given at her earnest appeal a responsible and lucrative position. She had been at her post only a few days when she began to talk of the pleasure trips she was going to have now she had come to that place. She was disturbed, discharged at the end of a month for negligence and incompetence. As two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time, so the mind that is occupied with pleasure cannot also be concentrated upon the perfect performance of duty. Pleasure has its own place and time, but its consideration should not be allowed to enter the mind during those hours which should be devoted to duty. Those who, while engaged in their worldly task, are continually dwelling upon anticipated pleasures cannot be otherwise than bungle through their work or even neglect it when they their pleasure seems to be at stake. Thoroughness is actually completeness, perfection. It means doing a thing so well that there is nothing left to be desired. It means doing one's work, if not better than anyone else can do it, at least not worse than the best that others do. It means the exercise of much thought, the putting forth of great energy, the persistent application of the mind to its task, the cultivation of patience, perseverance, and a high sense of duty. An ancient teacher said, if anything has to be done, let a man do it. Let him attack it vigorously. And another teacher said, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. He who lacks thoroughness in his worldly duties will also lack the same quality in spiritual things. He will not improve his character, will be weak and half-hearted in his religion, and will not accomplish any good and useful end. The man who keeps one eye on worldly pleasure and the offer on religion and the other on religion, and who thinks he can have the advantage of both conditions will not be thorough either in his pleasure seeking or his religion but will make a sorry business of both it is better to be a whole shouldered worldling than a half-hearted religionist better to give the entire mind to a lower thing than half of it to a higher it is perfect you know like it is preferable to be thorough even if it be in a bad or selfish direction rather than inefficient and square you know like squamous in good directions for thoroughness leads more rapidly to the development of character and the acquisition of wisdom it accelerates progress and unfoldment and while it leads the bad to something better it spurs the good to higher and ever higher heights of usefulness and power number six mind building and life building everything both in nature and the works of man is produced by a process of building the rock is built up of atoms the plant the animal and man are built up of cells a house is built of bricks and a book is built of letters a world is composed of a large number of forms and a city of a large number of houses the arts sciences and institutions of a nation are built up by the effort of individuals the history of a nation is the building of its deeds the process of building necessities at alternate process of breaking down old forms that have served their purpose are broken up and the material of which they are composed enters into a new combinations there is reciprocal in you know like integration and 
disintegration. In all compounded bodies, old cells are ceaselessly being broken up and new cells are formed to take their place. The works of man also require to be continually renewed until they have become old and useless. When they are torn down in order that some better purpose may be served, these two processes of breaking down and building up in nature are called death and life. In the artificial works of man, they are called destruction and restoration. This dual process, which obtains universally in things visible, also obtains universally in things invisible. As a body is built of cells and a house of bricks, so a man's mind is built of thoughts. The various characters of men are none other than compounds of thoughts of varying combinations. Herein we see the deep truth of the saying, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Individual characteristics are fixed process of thought. That is, they are fixed in the sense that they have become such an integral part of the character that they can be only altered, that they can only be altered or removed by a you know, like a protracted effort of the will and by much self-discipline. Character is built in the same way as a tree or a house is built, namely by the ceaseless addition of new material and that material is thought. By the aid of millions of bricks, a city is built. By the aid of millions of thoughts, a mind, a character is built. Every man is a mind builder, whether he recognizes it or not. Every man must perforce think, you know, and, and every thought is another brick laid down in the edifice of mind. Such bricklaying is done loosely and carelessly by a vast number of people, the result being unstable and tottering characters that are ready to go down under the first little gust of trouble or temptation. Some also put into the building of their minds large numbers of impure thoughts. These are so many rotten bricks that crumble away as first as they are put in, leaving always an unfinished and un, you know, like unsightly building and one which can afford no comfort and no shelter for its possessor. possessor. Now, debilitating thoughts about one's health, innovating thoughts concerning unlawful pleasures, weakening thoughts of failure and sickly thoughts of self-pity and self-praise are useless bricks with which no substantial mind temple can be raised. Pure thoughts, wisely chosen and well-placed, are so many durable bricks which will never crumble away and from which a finished and beautiful building and one which affords comfort and shelter for its possessor can be rapidly erected. Bracing thoughts of strength, of confidence, of duty, inspiring thoughts of a large, free, unfettered and unselfish life are useful bricks with which a substantial mind temple can be raised. And the building of such a temple necessitates that old and useless habits of thought be broken down and destroyed. Build three more stately mansions, O oh my soul, as the swift reasons roll. Sorry, as the swift seasons roll. Each man is the builder of himself. If he is the occupant of a jerry-built hovel of a mind that lets in the rains of many troubles and through which blow the keen winds of often requiring disappointments, often recurring disappointments, let him get to work to build a more noble mansion which will afford him better protection against those mental elements. Trying to weakly sift the responsibility for this JD building onto the devil or his forefathers or anything or anybody but himself will neither add to his comfort nor help him to build a better habitation. When he wakes up to sense of his responsibility, and an approximate estimate of his power, then he will commence to build like a true walkman and will produce a symmetrical and finished character that will endure and be cherished by posterity and by posterity, and which while affording a never failing protection for himself will continue to give shelter to many a struggling one when he has passed away. 
The whole visible universe is framed on a few mathematical principles. All the wonderful works of man in the material world have been brought about by the rigid observance of a few underlying principles and all that there is to the making of a successful, happy and beautiful life is the knowledge and application of a few simple root principles. If a man is to erect a building that is to resist the you know, like the, the fire systems, he must build it on a simple mathematical principle or law such as the square of the circle. If he ignores this, his edifice will topple down even before it is finished. Likewise, if a man is to build up a successful, strong and exemplary life, a life that will stoutly resist the fiery storms of adversity and temptation, it must be framed on a few simple, undeviating moral principles. Four of these principles are justice, restitute, sincerity and kindness. These four ethical truths are to the making of a life, what the four lines of a square are to the building of a house. If a man ignores them and thinks to obtain success and happiness and peace by injustice, trickery and selfishness, he is in the position of a builder who imagines he can build a strong and durable habitation while ignoring the relative you know, like arrangement of mathematical lines and he will in the end obtain only disappointment and failure. He may for a time make money which will delude him into believing that injustice and dishonesty pay well but in reality his life is so weak and unstable that it is ready at any moment to fall and when a critical period comes as come it must his affairs, his reputation and his riches crumble to ruins and he is buried in his own desolation. It is totally impossible for a man to achieve truly successful and happy life who ignores the four molar principles in your, you know, like uh, enumerated. While the man who, you know, like scrupulously observes them in all his dealings can no more fail of success and blessedness than the earth can fail of the light and warmth of the sun so long as it keeps it to its lawful orbit. For he is working in harmony with the fundamental laws of the universe. He is building his life on a basic which cannot be altered or overthrown. And therefore all that he does will be so strong and durable. And all the parts of his life will be so coherent, harmonious and firmly neat that it cannot possibly be brought to ruin. In all the universal forms which are built up by the great invisible and unerring power, it will found that the observance of mathematical law is carried out with unfolding ex, you know, like execute down to the most mini detail. The microscope reveals the fact that the infinitely small is as perfect as the infinitely great. So, uh, you know, like a snowflake is as perfect as a star. Likewise, in the erection of a building by man, the, the, the strictest attention must be paid to every detail. A foundation must first be laid and although it is to be buried and hidden, it must receive the greatest care and be made stronger than any other part of the building. Then stone upon stone, brick upon brick is carefully laid with the aid of the plumb line until at last the building stands complete in its durability strength and beauty even so it is with the life of a man he who would have a life secure and blessed a life freed from the miseries and failures to which so many fall victims must carry the practice of the moral principles into every detail of his life into every momentary duty and trivial transaction in every little things he need to be thorough and honest neglecting nothing to neglect or simply misapply any little detail, be he commercial man, you know, like agriculturist, professional man or artisan is the same as neglecting a stone or a brick in a building and it will be a source of weakness and trouble. The majority of those who fail and come to grief do so 
through neglecting the apparently insignificant details. It is a common error to suppose that little things can be passed by and that the greater things are more important and should receive all attention but a, but a cursory glance at the universe as well as little serious reflection on life will teach the lesson that nothing great can exist which is not made up of small details and in the composition of which every detail is perfect. He who adopts the four ethical principles as the law and base of his life, who raises the edifice of character upon them, who in his thoughts and words and actions does not wander from them, whose every duty and every passing transaction is performed in strict accordance with their exactions, such a man laying down the hidden foundation of integrity of heart securely and strongly cannot fail to raise up a structure which shall bring him honor and he is building a temple in which he can repose in peace and blessedness even the strong and beautiful temple of his life number seven cultivation of concentration Concentration or the bringing of the mind to a center and keeping it there is vitally necessary to the accomplishment of any task. It is a father of thoroughness and the mother of excellence. As a faculty, it is not an end in itself, but it is an aid to all faculties, all work. Not a purpose in itself, it is yet a power which serves all purposes. Like steam in machines, it is a dynamic force in the machinery of the mind and the functions of life. The faculty is a common possession and though in its perfection it is rare just as will and reason are common possessions, though a perfectly poised will and a comprehensive reason are rare possessions and the mystery which some modern mystical writers have thrown around it is entirely superfluous every successful man in whatever direction his success may lie practice concentration though he may know nothing about it as a subject of study every time one becomes absorbed in a book or task or is wrapped in devotion or you know like assiduous in duty concentration in a greater or lesser degree is brought into play many books purporting you know like to give instruction on concentration make its practice and acquisition an end in itself then this there is no sure nor swifter way to its destruction the fixing of the eyes upon the tip of the nose upon a door knob a picture a mystical symbol or the portrait of a saint or the centering of the mind upon the navel the pineal gland or you know like or or some imaginary point in space i have seen all these methods seriously advised in works on this subject with the object of acquiring concentration is like trying to nourish the body by merely moving the jaw as in the act of eating without taking food such methods prevent the end at which they aim they lead towards this you know like dispersion and not concentration towards weakness and you know like imbecility rather than towards power and intelligence i have made those who have squandered by these practices that measure of concentration they at first possess and have become the prey of a weak and wandering mind concentration is an aid to the doing of something it is not the doing of something in itself a ladder has no divine knowledge or the the sweeping of a flow without restoring without resorting to methods which have no practical bearing of life for what is concentration but the bringing of a well-controlled mind to the doing of that which has to be done he who does his work in an aimless, a hurried or thoughtless manner and resorts to his artificial concentration methods, to his door knob, his picture or nasal extremity in order to gain that which he imagines to be some kind of mystical power but which is very ordinary and practical quality. Though he may drift towards insanity and I knew one man who became insane by these practices, he will not increase is in steadiness of mind 
the great enemy of concentration and therefore of all skill and power is a wavering wandering undisciplined value in and of itself but only in so far as it enables us to reach something which we could not otherwise reach in like manner concentration is that which enables the mind to accomplish with ease that which it would be otherwise impossible to accomplish but of itself it is a dead thing and not a living accomplishment concentration is so in interwoven with the issue, with the uses of life that it cannot be separated from duty and he who tries to acquire it apart from his task his duty will not only fail but will diminish and not in you know increase his mental control and executive capacity and so render himself less and less fit to succeed in his undertakings a scattered and undisciplined army would be useless to make it effective in action and swift in victory it must be solidly concentrated and masterfully directed scattered and diffused thoughts are weak and worthless thoughts marshaled commanded and directed upon a given point are invincible confusion doubt and difficulty give way before their mastery approach concentrated thought enters largely into all successes and informs all victories there is no more secret about its acquaint you know like acquirement than about any other acquisition for it is governed by the underlying principle of our development namely practice to be able to do a thing you must begin to do it and keep on doing it until the thing is mastered the principle prevails universally in all arts sciences trades in all learning conduct religion to be able to paint one must paint to know how to use a tool skillfully he must use the tool to become learned he must learn to become wise he must do wise things and to successfully concentrate his mind he must concentrate it but the doing is not all it must be done with energy and intelligence the beginning of concentration concentration then is to go to your daily task and put your mind on it bringing all your intelligence and mental energy to a focus upon that which has to be done and every time the thoughts are found wandering aimlessly away they should be brought promptly back to the thing in hand thus the center upon which you are to bring your mind to a point is not your pineal you know like gland or a paint in space but the work which you are doing every day and your object in thus concentrating is to be able to do your work with smooth rapidity and consume its skill for until you can thus do your work you have not gained any degree of control over the mind you have not acquired the power of concentration this powerful focusing of one's thought and energy and will upon the doing of things is difficult at first as everything worth acquiring is difficult but daily efforts strenuously made and patiently followed up will soon lead to a such measure of self control as will enable one to bring a strong and penetrating mind to bear upon any work undertaken a mind that will quickly comprehend all the details of the work and dispose of them with accuracy and dispatch he will thus as his you know like concentrative capacity increases enlarge his usefulness in the scheme of things and increases value to the world thus inviting nobler opportunities and opening the door to higher duties he will also experience the joy of a wider and fuller life in the process of con concentration there are four following stages number 1 attention number 2 contemplation number 3 abstraction number 4 activity in repose at first the thoughts are arrested and the mind is fixed upon the object of concentration which is the task in hand this is attention the mind is then roused into vigorous thought concerning the way of proceeding with the task this is contemplation protected protracted contemplation leads to a condition of mind in which the doors of the senses are all closed against the entrance of outside directions the thoughts being wrapped in and the solely and solely and intensely centered upon the work in hand this is abstraction the mind thus centered in profound cognition sorry cogitation reaches a state in which the maximum of work is accomplished with the minimum of friction this is activity in repose attention is the first stage in all successful work they who lack it fail in everything such are the lazy thoughtless the indifferent and incompetent what when attention is followed by an awakening of the mind to serious thought then the second stage is reached 
to ensure success in all ordinary worldly undertakings it is not necessary to go beyond these two stages they are reached in a greater or lesser degree by all that large army of skilled and competent workers which carries out the work of the world in its manifold departments and only a comparatively smaller number reach the third stage of abstraction for when abstraction is reached we have entered the sphere of genius in the first two stages the work and the mind are separate and the work is done more or less laboriously and with a degree of friction but in the third stage a marriage of the work with the mind takes place there is a fusion a union and the two become one then there is a superior efficiency with less labor and friction in the perfection of the first two stages the mind is objectively engaged and is easily drawn from its center by external sights and sounds but when the mind has attained perfection in abstraction the sub objective method of working is accomplished as distinguished from the objective the thinker is then oblivious to the outside world but is vividly alive in his mental operations if spoken to he will not hear and if plied with more vigorous appeals he will bring back his mind to outside things as one coming out of a dream indeed this abstraction is a kind of waking dream but its similarity to a dream ends with the subjective state it does not obtain in the mental operation of that state in which instead of confusion of dreaming there is perfect order penetrating insight and a wide range of comprehension whoever attains to perfection in abstraction will manifest genius in the particular work upon which his mind is centered inventors artists poets scientists philosophers and all men of genius are men of abstraction they accomplish subjectivity and with ease that which the objective workers men who have not yet attained beyond the second stage in concentration cannot accomplish with the most strenuous labor when the fourth stage that of activity in repose is attained then concentration in its perfection is acquired i am unable to find a single word which will fully express this dual condition of intense activity combined with steadiness or rest and have therefore employed the term activity in repose the term appears contradictory but a simple illustration of a spinning top will serve to explain the paradox when a top spins at the maximum velocity the friction is reduced to the minimum and the top assumes that condition of perfect repose which is a sight of so beautiful to the eye and so captivating to the mind of the schoolboy who then says his top is asleep the top is apparently motionless but it is the rest not of innate you know like inertia but of intense and perfectly balanced activity so the mind that has acquired perfect concentration is when engaged in that intense activity of thought which results in productive work of the highest kind in a state of quiet poise and calm repose externally there is no apparent activity no disturbance and the face of a man who has acquired this power will assume a more or less radiant calmness and the face will be more sublimely you know like sublimely calm when the mind is most intensely engaged in active thought each stage of concentration has its particular power thus the first stage when perfected leads to usefulness the second leads to skill ability talent the third leads to originality and genius while the fourth leads to mastery and power and makes leaders and teachers of them in the development of concentration also as in all object of growth the following stages embody the preceding ones in their entirety thus in contemplation attention is contained in abstraction both attention and contemplation are embodied and he who has reached the last stage brings into play in the act of contemplation all the four stages he who has perfected himself in concentration is able at any moment to bring his thoughts to a point upon on any matter and to search into it with the strong light of an active comprehension he can both take a thing up and lay it down with equal deliberation he has learned how to use his thinking faculties to fixed purpose and guide them towards defined definite ends he is an intelligent doer of things and not a weak wanderer amid chaotic thought decision energy or alertness as well as 
deliberate you know like deliberation judgment and gravity accompany the habit of concentration and that vigorous mental training which its cultivation involves leads to ever increasing usefulness and success in worldly occupations towards that higher form of concentration called meditation in which the mind becomes divinely illuminated and acquires the heavenly knowledge number 8 practice of meditation when aspiration is united to concentration the result is meditation when a man intensely desire to reach and realize a higher purer and more radiant life than the merely worldly pleasures loving life he engages in aspiration and when he earnestly concentrates his thoughts upon the finding of that life he practices meditation without intense aspiration there can be no meditation lethargy and indifference are fatal to its practice the more intense the nature of a man the more rapidly will he find meditation and the more successfully will he practice it a fiery nature will most rapidly scale the heights of truth in meditation when its aspirations have become sufficiently awakened concentration is necessary to worldly success meditation is necessary to spiritual success worldly skill and knowledge are acquired by concentration spiritual skill and knowledge are acquired by meditation by concentration a man can scale the highest heights of genius but he cannot scale the heavenly heights of truth to accomplish this he must meditate by concentration a man may acquire the wonderful comprehension and vast power of a caesar by meditation he may reach the divine wisdom and perfect peace of a buddha the perfection of concentration is power the perfection of meditation is wisdom by concentration men acquire skill in the doing of the things of life in science art trade etc but by meditation they acquire skill in life itself in right giving enlightenment wisdom etc saints sages saviors wise men and divine teachers are the finished products of holy meditation the four stages in concentration are brought into play in meditation the difference between the two powers being one of direction and not of nature meditation is there for spiritual concentration the bringing of the mind to a focus in its search for the divine knowledge the divine life the intense dwelling in thought on truth thus a man aspires to know and realize above all things else the truth he then gives attention to conduct to life to self production to self purification giving attention to these things he passes into serious contemplation of the facts problems and mystery of life thus contemplating he comes to love truth so fully and intensely as to become wholly absorbed in it the mind is drawn away from its wanderings in a multitude of desires and solving one by one the problems of life realizes that profound union with truth which is the state of abstraction and thus absorbed in truth there is that balance and poise of character that divine action in repose which is the abiding calm and peace of an emancipated and enlightened mind meditation is more difficult to practice than concentration because it involves a much more you know like severe self discipline than that which obtains in concentration a man can practice concentration without purifying his heart and life whereas the process of purification is inseparable from meditation the object of meditation is divine enlightenment the attainment of the truth and in therefore is therefore interwoven with practical purity and righteousness thus while at first the time spent in actual meditation is short perhaps only half an hour in the early morning the knowledge gained in that half hour of vivid aspiration or you know like aspiration and concentrated thought is embodied in practice during the whole day in meditation therefore the entire life of a man is involved and as he advances in its practice he becomes more and more fitted to perform the duties of life in the circumstances in which he may be placed for the you know like for he becomes a stronger holier calmer and wiser the principle of meditation is twofold namely purification of the heart by repetitive thought on pure things number 2 attainment of divine knowledge by embodying such purity in practical life man is a thought being and his life and character are determined by the thoughts in which he habitually dwells by practice association and habit thoughts tend to repeat themselves with greater and greater ease and frequency and so fix the character in a given direction by producing that automatic action which is called habit by daily dwelling upon 
pure thoughts the man of meditation forms the habit of pure and enlightened thinking which leads to pure and enlightened actions and well performed duties by the ceaseless repetition of pure thoughts he at last becomes one with those thoughts and is a purified being manifesting his attainment in pure actions in a serene and wise life the majority of men live in a series of conflicting desires passions emotions and speculations and there are restlessness uncertainty and so but when a man begins to train his mind in meditation he gradually gains control over the inward conflict by bringing his thoughts to a focus upon a central principle in this way the old habits of impure and erroneous uh, you know like thought and action are broken up and the new habits of pure and enlightened thought and action are formed the man becomes more and more reconciled to truth and there is increasing harmony and insight a growing perfection and peace a powerful and lofty aspiration towards truth is always accompanied with a keen sense of the sorrow and brevity and mystery of life and until this condition of mind is reached meditation is impossible merely musing or whiling away the time in idle dreaming habits to which the word meditation is frequently applied are very far removed from meditation in the lofty spiritual sense which we attach to that condition it is easy to mistake you know like reverie for meditation this is a fatal error which must be avoided by one striving to meditate the two must not be confounded you know like reverie is a loose dreaming into which a man falls meditation is a strong purposeful thinking into which a man rises reverie is easy and pleasurable meditation is at first difficult and irksome now reverie thrives in idolence you know like and luxury meditation arises from strictness and discipline reverie is first alluring then sensuous and then sensual now meditation is first forbidding then profitable and then peaceful reverie Reverie is dangerous. It undermines self-control. Meditation is protective. It establishes self-control. There are certain signs by which one can know whether he is engaging in reverie or meditation. The indication of reverie are. Number one, a desire to avoid exertion. Number two, a desire to experience the pleasure of dreaming. Number three, an increasing distaste for one's worldly duties. Number four, a desire to shirk one's worldly responsibilities. Number five, fear of consequences. Number six, a wish to get money with as little effort as possible. Number seven, lack of self-control. Now, the indications of meditations are: number one, increase of both physical and mental energy. Number two, a strenuous striving after wisdom. Number three. a decrease of irksomeness in the performance of duty number 4 a fixed determination to faithfully fulfill all worldly responsibilities number 5 freedom from fear number 6 indifference to riches number 7 possession of self control there are certain times places and conditions in and under which it is impossible to meditate other where in it is difficult to meditate and others wherein meditation is rendered more accessible and these which should be known and carefully observed are as follows times place and conditions in which meditation is impossible number 1 at or immediately after meals number 2 in places of pleasure number 3 in crowded places number 4 while walking rapidly number 5 while lying in bed in the morning number 6 while smoking number 7 while lying on a couch or bed for physical or mental relaxation up times place and conditions in which meditation is difficult number 1 at night number 2 in a luxurious furnished room number 3 while sitting on on a soft yielding set number 4 while wearing gay clothing number 5 when in company number 6 when the body is weary number 7 the body is given too much food now times places and conditions in which it is best to meditate number 1 very early in the morning number 2 immediately before meals now number 3 in solitude number 4 in the open air or in a plainly furnished room number 5 while sitting on a hard sheet number 6 when the body is strong and vigorous number 7 when the body is modestly and plainly clothed it will be seen by the forgetting instructions that ease luxury and indulgence which induce uh, reverie render meditation difficult and when strongly pronounced make it impossible while strenuousness discipline and self denial make meditation comparatively easy the body too should be 
neither overfed nor starved, neither in rags nor, you know, like flauntingly clothed. It should not be tired, but should be at its highest point of energy and strength. As the holding of the mind to a concentrated train of subtle and lofty thought requires high degree of both physical and mental energy. Aspiration can often best be aroused and the mind renewed in meditation by the mental repetition of a lofty percept, a beautiful sentence or a verse of poetry. Indeed, the mind that is ready for meditation will instinctively adopt this practice. Mere mechanical repetition is worthless and even a uh, hinder you know like even a hindrance now the words repeated must be so applicable to one's own condition that they are dwelt upon lovingly and with concentrated devotion in this way aspiration and concentration harmoniously combine the produce combine to produce without uh, you know like without um, undue strain the state of meditation all the conditions above stated are of utmost importance in the early stages of meditation and should be carefully noted and duly observed by all who are striving to acquire the practice and those who faithfully follow the instruction and who strive and preserve or persevere will not fail to gather in in due season the harvest of purity, wisdom, bliss and peace and will surely eat of the sweet fruits of holy meditation. Number nine, the power of purpose. Depression, sorry, dispersion is a weakness. Concentration is power. Destruction is a scattering, you know, like a preservation, a uniting process. Things are useful and thoughts are powerful in its measure that their parts are strongly and intelligibly concentrated. Purpose is a highly concentrated thought. All the mental energies are directed to the attainment of an object and obstacles which intervene between the thinker and the object are one after another broken down and overcome. Purpose is the keystone in the temple of achievement. It binds, uh, it binds and holds together in a complete whole that which could you know like that which would otherwise lie scattered and useless empty whims em, you know like ephemeral fancies vague desires and half-hearted resolutions have no place in purpose in the sustained determination to accomplish there is an invincible power which swallows up all inferior considerations and marches direct to victory all successful men are men of purpose they hold fast to an idea a project a plan and will not let it go they cherish it brood upon it trained and develop it and when assailed by difficulties they refuse to be guided into surrender indeed the intensity of the purpose increases with the growing magnitude of the obstacles encountered the man the men who have molded the destinies of humanity have been men mighty of purpose like the roman laying his road they have followed along a well-defined path and have refused to serve aside even when torture and death confronted them the great leaders of the race are the mental road makers and mankind follows in the intellectual and spiritual paths which they have carved out and beaten great is the power of purpose to know how great let a man study in you know, let a man study it in the lives of those whose influence has shaped the ends of nations and directed the destinies of the world in an alexander you know like in an alexander caesar or a napoleon we see the power of purpose when it is directed in worldly and personally channels in a confusion sorry in a Confucius, a Buddha or a Christ, we perceive its vaster power when its course is along heavenly and impersonal paths. Purpose goes with intelligence. There are lesser and greater purposes according with degrees of intelligence. A great mind will always uh, be great of purpose. A weak intelligence will be without purpose. A drifting mind argues a measure of undevelopment. What can resist an unshakable purpose? What can stand against it or turn it aside? In art, you know, like inert matter, 
yields to a living force and circumstances and succumbs to the power of purpose. Truly the man of unlawful purpose who will in achieving his ends destroy himself but the man of good and lawful purpose cannot fail if it only needs that he daily renew the fire and energy of his fixed resolve to consume at his object. The weak man who grieves because he is misunderstood will not greatly achieve the vain man who steps aside from his resolve in order to please others and gain their you know like approbation will not highly achieve the double-minded man who thinks to compromise his purpose will fail the man who fixed purpose you know like the man of fixed purpose who whether misunderstandings and foul accusations or flatteries and pair promises rain upon him does not yield a fraction of his resolve is a man of excellence and achievement of success greatness and power hindrance stimulate the man of purpose difficulties nerve him to renewed exertion mistakes loses pains do not subdue him and failures are steps in the ladder of success for he is over conscious of the certainty of final achievement all things at last yield to the silent irresistible all conquering energy of purpose out of the night that covers me black as the peat from pole to pole i thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul in the fell clutch of circumstance i have not whined nor cried aloud under the bloody going of chance my head is bloody but unbowed it matters not how straight the gate how charged with punishment the scroll I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Number 10. The joy of accomplishment. Joy is always the accomplishment of a task successfully accomplished. An undertaking completed or a piece of work done always brings rest and satisfaction. When a man has done his duty, he is light-hearted and happy, says Emerson. And no matter how insignificant the task may appear, the doing of it faithfully and with whole-souled energy always results in cheerfulness and peace of mind. Of all miserable men, the, 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 the seeker is the most miserable. Thinking to find ease and happiness in avoiding difficult duties and necessary tasks which require the expenditure of labor and exertion, his mind is always uneasy and disturbed. He becomes burdened with an inward sense of shame and forfeits manliness and self-respect. He will he who will not work according to his faculty, let him perish according to his necessity, says Carlyle. And it is a moral law that the man who avoids duty and does not work to the full extent of his capacity does actually perish, first in his character and last in his body and circumstances. Life and action are synonymous, and immediately a man tries to escape exertion, either physically or mentally, he has commenced to decay. On the other hand, the energetic increase in life by the full exercise of their powers, by overcoming difficulties and by bringing to completion or completion tasks which, co which coiled for the strenuous use of mind or muscle. How happy is a child when a school lesson long labored over is mastered at last? The athlete who has strained his body through long months or years of discipline and strain is richly blessed in his increased health and strain and is met with the rejoicing of his friends when he carries home the prize from the field of contest. After many years of ungrudging toil, the heart of the scholar is gladdened with the advantages and powers which learning bestows. The businessman grappling increasingly with difficulties and drawbacks is amply rapid in the happy assurance of well-earned success. And the you know, horticulturist, vigorously contending with the stubborn soil, sits down at last to eat of the fruits of his labor.
every successful accomplishment even in worldly things is rap you know like repaid with its own measure of joy and in spiritual things the joy which supervenses upon the perfection of purpose is sure deep and abiding great is the heart filled joy albeit in a feeble when after innumerable and apparently unsuccessful attempts some ingrained fault of character is at last cast out to trouble its arched while victim and the world no more the striver after virtue he who is engaged in the holy task of building up a noble character takes at every stage of conquest over self a joy which does not again leave him but which becomes an integral part of his spiritual nature all life is a struggle both without and within there are conditions against which man must contend his very existence is a series of efforts and accomplishments and his right to remain among men as a useful unit of humanity depends upon the measure of his capacity for wrestling successfully with the elements of nature without or with the enemies of virtue and truth within it is demanded of man that he shall continue to strive after better things after greater perfection after higher and still higher achievements and in accordance with the measure of his obedience to his demand does the angel of joy wait upon his footsteps and minister upon him for he who is anxious to learn eager to know and who puts forth efforts to accomplish finds the joy which you know like which eternally sings at the heart of the universe first in little things then in greater and then in greater still must man strive until at last he is prepared to make the supreme effort and strive for the accomplishment of truth succeeding in which he will realize the eternal joy the price of life is effort the aim of effort is accomplishment the reward of accomplishment is joy blessed is the man who strives against his own selfishness he will test in its fullness the joy of accomplishment thank you thank you for being patient being patient and listening to this whole story or whole book along with me i think i think you love it and um, it is really a great pleasure to read this books and um, okay so if you like this please don't forget to like and share with your friends and colleagues and don't forget to subscribe to my channel let me know in the comment section below do you like this book and especially uh, do you like my reading style or not i would like to mention and i like to sorry uh, for the background noises uh, that may often occur and at the same time i would like to say that i always try to keep this reading very spontaneous so that i can make myself feel that i am among you all sitting and reading this book out to you because i love reading aloud i don't know why so yeah uh, stay blessed and uh, soon i will be coming with an another beautiful uh, story or book and i'm really grateful for the comments that you guys make um and i also grateful for getting certain suggestions i will definitely going to work on those like i will definitely come with the you know like with the uh, with the reading of those books um, um so yeah till then stay blessed stay happy and smile that's it thank you so much